Welcome. I'm Valerie Gerstein. It's nice to come together in New York City and hello to all the people who are on the live stream and hello to all of you who told me you're going to watch this later. What is next for global Jewish communities? I'm very interested in this discussion. I'm very much looking forward to hearing what you all have to say. I have two children here in New York City that go to a Jewish day school and either those of us here are watching, we either have kids or we have kids in our lives that we care about. Education is essential. And I believe in STEM education very much. And when I was introduced to the ORT schools through National Young Leadership Cabinet, my first visit was in Madrid, Spain. And then my second mission with cabinet was to St. Petersburg in Russia. And in St. Petersburg, not only did we see exceptional STEM experiments, contests, but we also saw dance and we saw art and we saw joyful children learning together in an exceptional school. We saw the ORT Fab Lab, it's a 3D lab. We saw preschool and elementary students together. And then that was my last mission with cabinet. <laughs> the world shut down. But together, I got to know more of you. And we said, we're not gonna let travel hold us back. And with the power of technology and STEM and Zoom, we had a reunion with our friends who had kids, with our friends around the country who had kids in their lives that they cared about and they knew that education was not as readily available to them as it had been before. And we had a reunion with the ORT leadership in Madrid, the same people who toured us around their school, the same people who led the next generation of Jewish leaders in that school, but treating them as leaders today, giving them the kavod they deserved in their classrooms right then. And they gathered us and they gave us an update about what was going on in their school. And they spoke, if you remember, about the mental health that was paramount at that time. So not only were they giving the education, they were giving the community. And to have been there in person and then to be there together on Zoom gave me so much pride in supporting ORT and um, a, a great belief in what is available to this global network of schools. You talk about global citizenship and global citizens and students. And one of the things that I think that my children also were able to receive during COVID as one of the few blessings is to see how small the world is, to be able to connect with students around the world. And there were some amazing programs that you put together. In fact, some of the most quotable programs that I attended were through ORT and JFNA and Cabinet. And I quote you, you were on a beautiful panel with other women leaders of major Jewish organizations. And it was so powerful to see and we heard about how the federations were working together with ORT to make sure that we were supporting students and their families. It's my honor to introduce Dan Green and Eric Fingerhut. Dan was appointed World ORT's Director General and CEO in June of 2020. He joined the ORT family in 2012 as the CEO of ORT UK, where he was responsible for raising funds for ORT projects around the world. Prior to joining Joining ORT, Dan worked in consumer media, managing cross-platform sales departments for print and digital publishing companies, such as Time Inc. Media, BBC Magazines, and The Jewish Chronicle. And we were talking about how so many people can be in different industries and then move into Jewish communal work. And all of us can see ourselves in you. And as you inspire us, I hope that my cabinet, Hevra, will be inspired and to see the potential of where we can grow. Eric Fingerhut was appointed as president and CEO in May of 2019. What an intense time. Hmm. Prior to joining JFNA, Eric was president and chief executive officer of Hillel International. And the last time we were together was at the No Hate, No Fear Solidarity March in New York City across the Brooklyn Bridge. How time right. changes so quickly. It's now my honor to introduce Barbara Birch, who's the president and CEO of ORT America. 
I've been very inspired by you, and I'm very interested in hearing about what you can teach us today. Thank you. Thank goodness. Thank you so much, Valerie. Um, Valerie, that was really, we obviously picked the right person for that introduction. Your, your personal connection and passion for education and young people and Jewish communities all over the world and the fact that you've had so many opportunities to see them up close, is, it really just all comes through and thank you so much for all you've done for us and for being here. Um, and thank you, Dan and Eric, for joining us tonight for an in person and virtual or in conversation. It's a virtual series we started in 2020 and this is the first time we're able to bring at least some of our closest um, friends and family together in this beautiful space. Um, I do wanna say one quick word. I'm really delighted that we're at the Stephen Wise Free Synagogue which um, has a really strong commitment to social justice issues and causes. So it feels very appropriate that we're gonna be talking about all of the things we're gonna talk about tonight in, in this space, and I hope we'll have opportunities in the future. Um, a word, Dan Green arrived today, so he thinks it's about midnight or so. So <laughs> we'll, you know, we'll talk slowly. <laughs> um, no, but it really is such a pleasure to all be here together. Um, I also just want to acknowledge the historic partnership um, of JFNA and ORT um, is really meaningful, important to us, and we are really proud to be with the other international partners um, that do all the work on the ground to um, turn sort of the vision and hopes and dreams into reality. So um, this is really a great opportunity to hear from both of you um, about a topic that I have um, found really um, fascinating, in particular in the last few years since I came to ORT, we tend to focus quite a bit on two major centers of Jewish life, Israel and North America, um, both for very important reasons and um, very important conversations. Um, but when I came to ORT, there was this sort of additional component that wasn't always top of the conversation. There are the, the few million other Jews who live in 70 countries um, around the world and you know what their experience is and how it differs and how diverse it is. And so tonight I think is gonna be a chance for us to really think about those Jewish communities, um, what, they, what, what it's like on the ground for them um, as opposed to sort of you know, maybe broad sound bites that we tend to hear in, uh, in, in the news or in the media. Um, and, and really understand what, what they need um, and what we can do to, to be supportive, and frankly, why we should, why, why that matters. Um, so that is, um, is the basis for our conversation, and I think on that note, we will um, jump right in. Um, and Eric, I'm gonna start by asking you, what is the role of federations in sustaining and revitalizing Jewish life around the world? Well, Barbara, first of all, thank you so much for having me here, and thanks to everybody who's in the uh, synagogue and, and also online, and Dan, it's a pleasure to be with you in person. I was trying to remember if we've actually met in person. It feels like we have because we've been on Zoom so much, but, uh, but it, it may, this may be the first time we've been in the, in the same room, so mazel tov on your appointment, and we look forward to working together. And um, Valerie, thank you for, uh, for your leadership of the Young Leadership Cabinet and, uh, uh, and, and of ORT. Um, I, I want to start also, if I could say, Barbara, you, you said a word about the, the partnership between uh, the Jewish federations. I think it's really important for the listeners to know, you know, JFNA is another one of those alphabet soup of acronyms that, uh, that the Jewish world loves to, to jumble together. Uh, so I actually prefer not to use it because it's the Jewish federations of North America, of which there are 100. And 46 Jewish federations, plus dozens of smaller communities that aren't organized uh, into full federations because of their size. And it's that, it's the collective support of those 146 communities as organized through their professional and volunteer leaders of their federations that have the historic commitment to ORT, not some uh, you know, acronym in, uh, uh, in New York. And it's important because as I answer your question, um, I think that, that, uh, that one of the things that I hope that that I can communicate effectively tonight is the fact that Jews, uh, wherever we live, 
uh, organize ourselves uh, into uh, communal organizations. We, you know, we always joke about all the, the Jewish communal organizations, but we organize ourselves for a purpose because we have a responsibility to care for each other and to care for Jews around the world. So when we talk about building flourishing Jewish communities uh, in each of the 146 Federation communities and, Jew and to support Jewish communities around the world, we're talking about building communities that are healthy, that are caring, that are safe, that are welcoming and inclusive, that are educated and engaged, uh, that are involved in the broader community and that are deeply connected to Jews uh, around the world uh, and of course in the state of Israel. And I, and I make sure that people understand that that means in every community you're supposed to be connected to Jews around the world. It's not that you belong to some organization, and again, that has an office in New York that, that through them does it, but no, you have to, we have to make sure that everybody has that personal connection. Um, so when we think about uh, about our role as, as Jewish federations that I'm, that I'm so proud to be associated with, that one of the things that we're able to tell uh, any member of a Jewish community is that through their local federation, they can reach out and help any Jew anywhere in the world uh, to build their community, to build their lives, to educate their children, to secure their homes and their synagogues and their businesses. Uh, and so for us, we feel in that connectedness every day. And that's part of our mission, part of why we exist. Thank you, thank you for that. Dan, maybe you can add, so ORT is one of the organizations that's doing a lot of what Eric just described that's happening in the communities across North America and abroad. We are on the ground in those communities all over the world. And maybe you can just say a word about what that what that looks like, what that feels like today. And of course, there's huge diversity to say something about what's happening today in the former Soviet Union in Moscow or St. Petersburg is gonna be very different from Europe or Latin America. So if you want to hone in on sure. a few places and give us a little bit more color for what that looks like. Okay. Well, firstly, it's really, really great to be here and um, great to share a platform with, uh, with Eric and thank you for having me. Uh, and it's a great opportunity to speak to you here tonight and obviously wherever you are around the, uh, around the United States about our great organization. And um, I think diversity is, is, is one of the key words I would use that really um, describes what we're all about. You know, whether it's um, our breadth of uh, operations right across the globe, uh, the type of educational institutions that we have, or the kind of beneficiaries that we serve, um, typically um, young people, students at school, but not exclusively. Uh, one of the things that we really focus on is something called lifelong learning, really education for life. And in many places around the world, we have um, programs for adults uh, and senior citizens as well. And the work that we carry out um, really is so diverse from place to place and there's certainly no one size fits all. Um, no easy way, no, no very short, I'm afraid, elevator pitch to describe what we do um, around the world. But we certainly have some centers of uh, operation which are perhaps more of a priority for us. Uh, and certainly Israel, and that will always remain to be the case, our, our, our school there, a youth village called Kfar Silva near Ashkelon, which is World Ort's own school, and many affiliated schools and colleges that, that we work with serving um, students and communities in the periphery of Israel. Um, and of course, um, for 30 years now, our work in the former Soviet Union, I say for 30 years now, we were actually born in 1880, in St. Petersburg, so 141 years ago, we started in, in Russia, but um, because of the course of history, we had to, to leave there for, for around 50 years. But we came back in the early 90s, and today we have um, 16 schools in seven countries. We serve um, around 40,000 beneficiaries uh, in the former Soviet Union. Around half of them are, are student school age, and the rest, as I said, are of all different ages. So that's a huge focus in terms of what we're doing there. And it's a very unique story, and perhaps we'll, we'll, we'll have an opportunity to explore that a little bit afterwards in terms of our impact on the ground in the former Soviet Union, really revitalizing Jewish life um, across those countries. Um, 
And then right across Latin America as well, where we have a very, very strong footprint. We have a school in Buenos Aires. I'm, I'm not sure if you ever visited yeah, it. Was there. You have uh, the largest Jewish school in the diaspora. Nearly 10,000 students uh, attend that school, and they're currently fundraising to build a fourth campus in, uh, in, a, in the neighborhood of Tigres, which is just highlighting the demographics of the Jewish community and where they're, they're spreading out to, uh, that will take that student roll up to 11,000. So um, vast sort of areas of operation that we have to cover. And World Ought's purpose, my team in London and staff that we have around the world is really to support that network of activities however we can, giving professional development and leadership training to our teachers and bringing our students together, usually in person, now obviously um, virtually, um, and having that cross-fertilization of ideas and encounters with students and teachers, really creating and building a network. Um, and one of the things I'm probably proudest of is how our network continues to grow. Um, just in the last few years, Jewish community schools in Spain, in Madrid, and Barcelona, in Bogota, in Singapore, and soon hopefully in Costa Rica, have uh, knocked on our door and said, we want to join you, we want to be part of this global Jewish network. Uh, how can we join and how can we be part of that? Because certainly for many communities, certainly those perhaps a little bit more isolated, smaller communities, really want to reach out and be part of uh, a much wider Jewish family, and that's something that, that we can certainly offer. Thank you. I'm just going to ask you a follow-up to that. Um, maybe you can share a few examples of the kinds of things that, that those Jewish communities need or experience in particular. So we're offering schools and the STEM education that Valerie saw and talked about, um, they're being connected globally, but what else is happening? Like is, um, you know, how do we help a community, you know, that's going through economic distress or, um, you know, in the former Soviet Union where we've been, along with many other organizations, returned after, you know, for the last 30 years. Like, how's it going? You're talking about growth in Buenos Aires. Is that the picture? Is global Jewish life shrinking or growing? Very, very different dynamics in, in, in those places, for, for sure. Um, the economic situation um, in, across Latin America is, uh, is very difficult and um, in particular the fallout from the pandemic and the impact that that had financially on the community there um, has really, really told. And, um, you know, our schools in, in across Latin America, unlike those in Israel or across the former Soviet Union, which are all state schools, in Latin America they're all private schools. The parents pay tuition fees and uh, around 50% of all families in Latin America at the moment are on some form of subsidy from between 25 to 100%. And that's only been exacerbated by the, uh, the effects of the pandemic, unfortunately. So yes, of course, we're there to help them uh, wherever we can. Um, you know, we remember to the early 2000s when there was um, significant economic problems for the Jewish community. Um, particularly in Argentina, and we stepped in and helped them then, and, and this is the same need that's repeated today. So, um, you know, one of the other things that sort of really gladdened my heart when, when the pandemic happened was that our supporters from around the world were really able to step up and support communities like those in, in Latin America and those in the former Soviet Union and other places as well to, you know, bridge that gap. Uh, that financial gap where it was needed. Um, but the need, for example, in, uh, across the former Soviet Union is, is a very, very different one. And I would say there our impact, um, in some ways, although we're known as an organization that promotes and advances STEM education and, and science and technology is and remains at the forefront of what we do in places like the former Soviet Union, um, although the, uh, the, the parents send their children to our schools because of that STEM education. What they get in return is the start of, I think, a Jewish journey. And this goes back again to um, those long dark years um, under communism when obviously um, Jewish practice was um, virtually outlawed and, and, and very, very difficult. And I suppose in the early 1990s, people you know, came out of that darkness almost blinking into the light 
and, and slowly, slowly and tentatively started uh, re-engagement with their Jewish, uh, Jewish roots. But for many, many families, those Jewish roots have remained hidden. And the first connection, that first spark um, that our students get and then their parents and grandparents get is when they attend an art school because the parents send them to the best school in the city, which is an art school, which happens to, for them to be Jewish, but they come out of it and they start to grow and feel and rekindle that love and that spark and that flame of Yiddishkeit and that Jewish experience and that reconnecting to their roots. So as much as we are turning out fantastic students with um, you know, amazing opportunities for their futures, I think it's equally, if not more important, that reconnection that they have with their Jewish roots that we can achieve in the former Soviet Union. Thank you. Eric, we're, our audience is a North American audience, and um, actually I'm delighted those who are um, streaming can't see the audience, I don't think, but it's um, a pretty young audience, actually, which is really wonderful. And my original connection to you actually was when you were at Hillel. So I know that you are very invested in, in young people and in North American Jews and, and how they relate to this um, broader global picture. So I, I would love to know how you think about, um, through the work that you're doing, how important it is to, to help younger people understand this work and care about it and you know what do you tell them you know as yeah. far as their collective responsibility so before I tell you what I tell them I'll I'll because uh, I, I learned from them more I actually think this is the cusp of, of such an exciting time for the Jewish people um, look the technology that is enabling us to do this is taken for granted by you know all of our uh, young adults. They, they're, they're, they're digital natives, I guess uh, is the right word. Um, and you know, in their lifetime, the idea of connecting and staying in touch with people anywhere in the world is is not is taken for granted. Travel, God willing, again soon will be uh, something that is frequent and easy and uh, and uh, uh, and and enable people to connect with each other. So. We have the opportunity to be the most connected Jewish generation in the history of the Jewish people, which is just an amazing, really an amazing uh, uh, opportunity for us. Uh, and, and so in that respect, whether you're in a small community in America or you're in uh, New York City, the largest Jewish community in North America, or whether you're in a small community in Russia or in South America or uh, anywhere in the world, we have, we have an, an, op an opportunity to be connected to each other. And so for me, the most exciting thing is how do we help make sure that those connections happen. Uh, the other piece of it, and this really, you know, to, to Dan's excellent description of the quality education uh, and, uh, and how that is putting our young adults on, uh, on a Jewish journey and building a Jewish identity, we have everything in common. I mean, we are, we, we are you, know, you talk about the formal education that's, that happens in, uh, in, uh, in Jewish schools, but you know, Jews are master educators, right? We, we've created an entire uh, system of traditions and teachings and holidays and rituals that connect us to each other. We're reading the same Torah portion uh, every week and having an online discussion <coughs> about the same parts of the Torah. Some more and more millions of people are actually reading the Talmud day after day after day, and, and there's millions of different you know, conversations and connections going on that, are, that can be, by the way, in technology, instantly translated into, uh, into any language that you want. So, so for me, uh, and, and, and then the last thing I'll say about this generation uh, is they want to be connected. Right? There's, there's a, the, the more that our lives tend to be lived on, on social media, the more deeply we crave the personal connections um, and the relationships. The more you want to be part of something larger than this yourself, the more you want to have those, uh, those, deep, uh, those deep connections. So I, I think we just have a marvelous opportunity. Uh, and, and this is why the partnership between the Jewish Federation system and ORT, and of course you also know that our, 
our traditional partners are the Jewish Agency for Israel, which is located all over the world, uh, the, uh, the, the joint, JDC, which is able to reach and help uh, uh, a Jew in need anywhere in the world, through this, this network, and, and then of course, as I've already mentioned, we're in every, effectively every North American Jewish community is coming together to raise the funds, to build the connections, to support these things. So, so how do we turn all of this into, uh, into a situation where, where really we're the most connected generation uh, of, of the Jewish people in history? And, and, and I think it's an extraordinarily exciting time. I, I, you know, the, the one example that, that just blows me away that, has, that happened since I started uh, at, uh, at uh, the Federation system. So I started in uh, September of, uh, of 2019. I'm sorry, there's a, something's ringing and I'm gonna just stop it from ringing, I apologize. The, um, I started in September 2019. You may remember that uh, that Yom Kippur uh, was uh, the, uh, the, the year that there was an attack on a synagogue in Halle, Germany. Uh, which is about hour and a half, two hours outside of Berlin. I wouldn't have known it until I went there two weeks later. Um, and most people listening probably know the story, but the reason more people don't know the story is because this attack failed. And the reason the attack failed is because the organized Jewish community, you know, people make fun of that term, organized Jewish community, right? We're so, all these big organizations, but the organized Jewish community, funds were raised uh, in communities large and small across North America and across the world. They were allocated to the Jewish agency, which had a security team that went out and looked across um, the, uh, the world and saw places where Jews were particularly vulnerable assessed the need, saw what was needed, installed with funds raised here, security doors, security cameras, and saved the lives of 55 Jewish worshipers on Yom Kippur. Can you imagine how the history of this century would be different if there had been a massacre of 55 Jews at prayer at Yom Kippur on German soil in the 21st century? And why didn't that happen? It didn't happen because the Jewish community is connected to each other, right? because we cared about communities around the world, we helped raise the funds, we had a sophisticated uh, organization like the Jewish Agency that had the expertise on how to do it. Right? So the same thing is true about how we feel about Ortan, right? And Barbara, we, we know that there are Jews in need of the quality education, whether it's in Buenos Aires or in St. Petersburg or in any of the other uh, locations that you mentioned. And so there are Jews in these communities, large and small, the 146 federations that I'm proud to represent, that know exactly what they're doing, right? They know what they're doing. They know they're raising funds. They know they are giving it to, a, you know, to an expert organization so that we can build these, uh, these connections with each other. And, and, and Barbara, to come back to your question about young, you know, young leaders, that's what excites them. I mean, is there anything I mean, you, you, can, you, you can work for any startup or anything you want, and, and they cannot possibly be more sophisticated than what we have managed to create as a network uh, to keep the Jewish people alive, thriving, and flourishing uh, here in the 21st century. So that's, I, I, I present, instead of it looking like in this old 140, what was it, 140 years, how many, how many years, how many years old? I, I don't think there's anything more creative and innovative than this network that we've managed to, uh, to put together, sustain, and to adapt to the needs of the 21st century. And that's what excites young adults. So we, we show them, we take them on trips like Valerie to, uh, to see for themselves. Uh, our Young Leadership Cabinet studies these uh, issues. We have a new uh, group called Change Makers, which is ages 20 to 25. There's 1,800 of them uh, already participating, obviously working with high schools and colleges through, through Hillel's and youth groups and others as well, uh, and, and helping them see how they can reach out and make an impact anywhere in the world through this extraordinary network that they are part of because of who they are. Yeah, thank you for that. I also. I want to say, since you mentioned cabinet, and I didn't mention earlier, and I believe they are participating virtually, we're very proud to have two of your cabinet members um, participating with us as um, board observers um, for the first time. So um, Joe and Jan, who are both, I think, out there in the world, Thank have you, been Joe great, and Jan. <laughs> great partners to us. We're really glad they're not New Yorkers. And we actually so even got person. to come together. About 200 of them just came to. Uh, 
Carlsbad, California. So we had the first in-person uh, uh, activity right. in, in, in a while. That's great. And, and we're, we're trying to do the same thing, frankly, is That's to great. invest in our, our sort of up-and-coming future leaders um, and get them involved um, through ORT, but frankly, just in, in the Jewish community, in the Jewish world, and to see how their impact really can make a difference and how it matters. So we'll be happy for them to stay with us or join their local federation That's and great. just be a leader um, with more information and knowledge on, on what, how it matters. Um, so um, you mentioned JDC and Jaffe right. and, and we're ORT, of course, and um, I, I tend to think of those organizations um, working as sort of an ecosystem in a lot of these places. We each have a different piece of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. We're doing formal and informal Jewish education, and the Jewish agency is engaging in the communities with young people from Israel and um, bringing them to Israel and encouraging Aliyah. And JDC as a humanitarian organization is making sure Jews in need have everything they need. And we go on and on and on and on. Um, but I've also, as I said, I've really delved in more to um, how we are investing in, in global Jewish communities today over the last few years. And I've been, it's really interesting and fascinating to see all the other organizations that are bringing models of how we engage here with our Jewish communities here to communities. I mean, this is really for either of you. I hope you'll both have, have something to say about it, but organizations like Moisha House and PJ Library and, um, I don't know, I'm sure we can think of many LLs others. And so, JCCs. Yes, right, and BBYO has right. an international arm. Right. And so, you know, lots of organizations are stepping out into um, the international arena. Um, and I just wonder how you think about, are, are, we, um, are we working well together? Are we all still part of that ecosystem? And are we, you know, what does that mean for, I guess, either collective or... Um, how we can sort of make sure we're, we're doing all we can to support communities in the ways that they need it. Well, may, maybe I'll just start with two things and then I'd love to hear what Dan has to say. Uh, first is, you know, I made a joke about the alphabet soup of Jewish organizations. Uh, at the beginning, everything starts with a J for obvious reasons. Um, and, uh, you know, I remember, I remember when I was at Hillel and uh, there was starting to be all the BDS uh, 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 fights on campus and campaigns on campus and there are a number of organizations that were working on it and um, and uh, uh, the number the first thing somebody would ask me was well, why aren't you all working together and I used to say we are working together and we are literally are working together we like meet every week we coordinate we collaborate we share you know and so the same thing is true as we approach this global um, you know, this, this global work. We, we are working together every day. And your point is exactly right. It's a, it's a network where each has a different set of areas of expertise, contributes different things um, uh, to the puzzle. Um, our staffs are working together every day on the ground. Our professionals, our volunteers are working together on the ground. It, it really is a, a remarkably collaborative um, uh, world. So, so the number one thing, I just want people to know that that it is actually uh, a, a collaborative system. Uh, you know, during, uh, during COVID, uh, we convened, we called it an emergency coalition. It's, it, it became so, it was so tight knit that, um, that we've continued it, we call it Jewish Together. It's, the, it's camps, it's day schools, it's Hillel's, it's uh, BBYO, it's Moisha House, it's JCC's, it's the network of Jewish human services agencies, it's all the, all the synagogue denominations. We literally meet weekly to make sure that we're exchanging information, that we're sharing, uh, you know, that we're sharing all the, uh, uh, all the good information uh, that's out there. So, so I, I think it's important for people to know that um, that there really is, uh, there really is a collaborative uh, spirit in this. Um, and then the second point that I want to make, and, and this I, I really believe is true of our communities. I think it was true when, when I was at Hillel. I think it's true of uh, of youth groups. Is I, I really believe there's only two groups of Jews: those that we've engaged and those that we haven't engaged yet. All the baloney about we can't get to this one and we can't get to that one and we can't, you know, this, you know, this one, this one. I don't, I don't believe any of it. You know, everybody's so oh, 30% believe it, you know, won't do this and 20 It's all baloney, right? First of all, nobody has any real data uh, uh, regarding that. But the truth is, 
that we're all different, right? So people are interested in different things. And by the way, you're interested in different things at different times in your life. Are you interested in the same things, Dan, today that you were when you were 20 or when you were 30? I mean, we, we grow, we change when we have children, when we are empty nesters, when we, uh, you know, we, there's different, uh, and, and that's good, right? Because that keeps us intellectually challenged. So well, your point about bringing Moisha House and bringing Hillel and bringing BBYO and bringing Ort to new communities and bringing, uh, you know, JDC's got Entwine and the Jewish Agency has, 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 uh, has Project 10 now that's, you know, doing service work around the world. And of course, we have our Young Leadership Cabinet and Changemakers. These are, you need all these different initiatives uh, because people connect to different things in different ways and at different times. Uh, and so I don't look at this, uh, this abundance of, uh, of, 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 uh, uh, of Jewish uh, engagement outreach as a problem, as overlap. I look at it as, as, as what we need, we have to have, and frankly, we need more. And so the more that we see what works, the more we want to get behind them and expand them and help them grow. I, I, I'm a huge optimist. I, I think that we are connecting to more people today with Jewish education um, and with Jewish life uh, in more places in the world than at any time uh, in Jewish history. Uh, and because we show that we know how to do it, that should spur us to want to do even more. And there's much more yet to be done. I think just to sort of build on that, I'd kind of answer it in two ways. The, the, the first way is, is just thinking about our students and who they are and um, I suppose where they stand in their communities. So, so we obviously start the journey with them from a relatively young age. Um, and as I said, in, in some places we, we, we sort of kindle that spark again. Um, and what we see by the time they leave our schools is a stronger Jewish identity a much deeper engagement with, with their religion and with the Jewish community and hopefully a sense and purpose of wanting to give back and be part of something. So today we see many of our students or our alumni who are madrachim in, in Jewish agency summer camps in, in Russia and in Bulgaria. We see um, our alumni as a director of, uh, of our programs across Russia. I think the, the head of JDC Europe is, uh, is an alt alum, alumni as well. Um, many of those students go on to sort of great things, and some of them come back to us as well as, as teachers or as governors of, of our schools and programs. So, so they're engaged. Um, sometimes they emigrate to Israel or to Europe or to the North America, and we see a number of alumni from uh, Argentina, for example, who are very active in this country, for example. So they want to give back, and you know, they feel part of that Jewish community and that whole ecosystem that you talked about. So, so that's sort of on their sort of personal engagement, and I think as an organisation, um, we do work. Um, with the other partner agencies. For example, there's a, a fantastic program that we work with the, the Jewish agency with called Hefseba, which uh, ensures that Israeli teachers of Ivrit and Jewish studies um, are sent around the world uh, to provide another level of, of Jewish education, where sometimes it's not always easy to find um, enough or top quality Jewish educators, so we work very closely with the Jewish agency for that program, and that fills our schools with, with top-notch educators. Um, and we work with the JDC, certainly across the former Soviet Union, uh, where many of their community centers uh, have all programs running in them. Um, and there's a fantastic program that we set up recently, um, actually in Greece, which actually speaks to our international development work where we um, work with um, Syrian and Afghan refugees, um, giving them training for job skills and support in mental health and well-being, and that's a, a program that's run in partnership with, uh, with the JDC and also gets extra funding from uh, Microsoft Philanthropy as well. So um, for sure, we do, uh, we do work together uh, whenever that need is there. I wouldn't want people to think that, that these three partner organizations work in silos. Um, you know, it's so important that we can share expertise and resources as well. 
Thank you. Um, I also want to mention we are going to open up to all of you to ask questions. So I hope you're thinking about the questions that you might have. And I'm going to ask someone on my team to be ready with the microphone. Um, so while you're thinking about what you might want to ask and learn about, I guess I'll just put one other question out there, which is, um, what do you think that everyone should know? Instead of my asking you the question, is there something you think we didn't touch on that you think is so important or keeps you up at night or that you worry about when you think about global Jewish life? Um, I think certainly the, the fallout from the pandemic is, is still a, a very, very evident um, reality and, and concern for us. Um, I mentioned before, obviously, the, the financial impact, and that's something that is, is ongoing and I think will, will be with us for, for a number of years, certainly in, across the Latin American countries. Um, that's a big issue. Um, and I think as well, um, following on from COVID, in many ways, it's been remarkable how, you know, our entire school network, you know, almost overnight managed to, you know, pick up all of its activities and all of its lessons online and credit to, obviously to all of our teachers for being able to do that. Um, but what it cannot replace is that one-to-one -one contact between teacher and student. And I worry sometimes that we, we, we have got too used to um, learning virtually and having that um, comfort blanket almost, that we can go forward and expand classes and have bigger classes um, with the luxury of, of technology. And although we're a technology-based organization, um, nothing can replace that personal interaction. And you know, our desire and need is to get you know, students back into the classrooms as quickly as possible. Um, as they were before, or maybe not as they were before, because we've certainly learned lots of lessons in terms of how we teach um, remotely. And I think obviously some kind of hybrid format will um, continue going forwards. Um, but you know, we, we, we must always remember that, that that personal interaction is key and, and we've got to hopefully pray that we, we get that back as soon as possible. So I'll mention two things. One I've already mentioned, which is the issue of security is real. Um, and we, we can't enjoy Jewish life if we're not safe and secure in our synagogues, our, our Jewish community centers, our, uh, our, our neighborhoods. Um, and unfortunately, this has become uh, you know, a real responsibility uh, of our federations. We take, we take it seriously uh, and take responsibility. Uh, you know, I mentioned I started in September 2019, October. Uh, 2019 was the first anniversary of the Tree of Life shootings. We just celebrated, or just commemorated, not celebrated, October 27th, the third, uh, the third anniversary since then. You've had shootings in San Diego, Boston, Muncie, uh, tax in Muncie, Jersey City. Um, that's just in the States. I mentioned, of course, Holly, Germany, and other places um, uh, around the world. This has been the most violent time uh, in terms of attacks on Jews because they're Jews, and we can't ignore it. Uh, right now we have about 45 federations that have professionally run uh, security initiatives for their communities. We're in the middle of a major campaign called Live Secure, uh, the commitment of which is to both complete the security umbrella across, uh, across North America, but also to upgrade because there's always new technology. We also are your advocates in Washington for funding, for nonprofit security funding, which, which has grown, uh, thank goodness. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and it's a, uh, uh, it is unfortunately a priority that we're gonna have to continue and through our support of, of the Jewish agency, as I mentioned, we're supporting security efforts around the world. You talked about Buenos Aires, uh, what was 20 years since, you know, one of the worst uh, anti-Semitic attacks, violent attacks in the world occurred at the, uh, at the Jewish Community Center in Buenos Aires, which, which I visited and I'm sure you, you have been visited too. So uh, uh, on a not so happy note, we have to, uh, but we know we can do this, um, and, and we will do so, and certainly I want to thank our members, uh, the Young Leadership Cabinet and others who are helping us with this work. Um, on, on the, on the more, uh, back to the more optimistic side, the other, the other uh, note to mention is, is diversity. You know, I, I mentioned that a, a flourishing community is one that's welcoming and inclusive. This is the most diverse generation 
uh, of, uh, uh, of the Jewish people, uh, in part because of our connectiveness. We've always had Jews living in, in different parts of the world, uh, but now we are, you know, we're one big uh, family. We see that we don't all look alike, um, and even if we thought we did. By the way, Israel is a great model for us on this. Uh, I, I have a really vivid memory. I have a nephew who made Aliyah and be, was serving in the IDF and became a paratrooper. And, you know, they have a tekas, a ceremony, where they get their red uh, berets when they become paratroopers. And I went to this tekas and, first of all, I was bawling like a you know, kid because he was my nephew and he'd been at my Shabbos table and here he was becoming a paratrooper in the Israeli, you know, in the Israeli Defense Forces. But also the lineup of soldiers that were getting their red berets were from every part of the world and had every color skin, every language and every accent you could possibly imagine. And they were all Israeli, right? So we have it, we have it, and, and of course this is true across North America. And one of my colleagues who's here today, Rabbi Isaiah Rothstein, leads our Jewish edu uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion work. We just we simply need to be, uh, you know, to be conscious about inclusion. You, you mentioned you were kind of mentioned a couple times, Barbara, my work at Hillel. And I remember when I used to talk to, to students at Hillel, uh, student leaders at their local Hillel, and I'd always say, "So, what's your biggest problem?" And they say, "You know." It's, we, we want to make, make everybody feel welcome. How do we make everybody feel welcome? And I just want to say, if we wake up every morning and, and remind ourselves that, that you know, not everybody feels welcome walking into a, a building like this or a crowd like this without, you know, where not everybody, where people may not look like them or they don't uh, you know, know the, 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 the secret handshake or the, you know, the words that we use, that there's no secret handshake, don't, uh, don't you know, the, the, uh, you know the, the, the words that we use, the, 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 greetings, that we, the greetings that we use. So uh, you know, we've made a real commitment to it. Again, uh, I hope people will reach out to Rabbi Rothstein, who's, who's leading this work for us. And, uh, and so many others, but but we have a real chance to uh, to to be a truly inclusive community. Uh, we we know who each other are. As I've said, we can connect to each other in so many ways. We can do instant translation of anything of anything we want. Uh, and so I, I hope we'll commit ourselves uh, to uh, to being a really truly welcoming and inclusive and diverse community. Great. Do you all have questions? Oh, I see a head shaking, yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's, you're doing wonderful work. I have a, a, a broad question about the youth, and I can only talk about the United States, growing up, drifting away from Judaism, and, and, and facing BDS and other anti-Zionist uh, attacks on campus when they go to college. And we hear so many stories, Now I have personal experience of kids who go to Hebrew school, which is dull, and they have bat mitzvah, bat mitzvah, and then they go and play cricket, or not cricket, baseball, or football, and, and they drift away completely. Then they get to college, and they get attacked uh, by BDS supporters. What are you doing, and what should be done to counter that, to make the, 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 the right arguments, if you will. And I'm particularly interested in Ort's data, because you've been around for such a long time. Do you know whether your students, when they get to college and beyond, remain closely allied to Judaism, be it secular or religious, more so than Jews have, who've been not ex exposed to, to your instruction? I don't know, it might be hard data to, to collect. Uh, you, you'd want an, a, a Jewish group of students who haven't been to or exposed and those who have been and see how going out after so many years, whether you have, perhaps you have a secret source that you could use more broadly uh, in, in dealing with this issue that is so much on everybody's minds uh, about the youth drifting away. So I'm, I'm interested in your experience and your advice, and in fact, what you're doing about this. I, d I don't think there's any secret recipe for it. I think it's, um, for us, it's, again, it comes back to building that Jewish identity whilst um, they're with us. We've only got them for, a, I suppose, a finite time thinking about our high school students um, and sort of the values that we can inculcate uh, into them at that time. Um, but we're obviously sending them off into the world, to, to university, to other places, to other countries, and that we hope that we've given them, you know, a sound education 
and perhaps, as I said before, more importantly, um, a foundation in terms of Jewish identity. Um, I mean, in terms of sort of what you were saying about, you know, dealing with issues on campus, maybe it's more relevant for uh, here in the US or, or in the UK or some places. Um, I, I don't think we uh, ought really, um, you know, for us, for example, anti-Semitism, I, I think it's, it's a Gentile problem. It's not, a, it's not our problem. Um, but what we try and do is, is give people the tools with which to deal with it and cope with it and hopefully try to combat uh, anti-Semitism wherever they see it. Um, just in broader terms, in terms of the drift, um, and if you like, just sort of raising the topic of, I suppose, assimilation um, across the communities. Um, when we come to that sort of um, area, I always think, um, and it's always sort of worthwhile, I think, having a quote of um, the late, great um, Jonathan Sachs. Um, and he said something very profound. It was in 2013, just when he was finishing his time um, in the chief rabbinate um, in, in the United Kingdom. And when he was thinking about sort of Jewish communities worldwide at the time, he said that um, there were really two powerful movements in Jewish life at that time, uh, segregation and assimilation. And he said that Jews were either um, engaging in the world at the cost of disengaging from Judaism or engaging with Judaism at the cost of disengaging from, uh, from the world. And, um, you know, I think that sort of clarion call that, that he gave them was really to try and strengthen and promote a Judaism that can engage with the world today. And that's what we need, that kind of structure. Because I think, you know, without any kind of question, the kind of, um, you know, for a, I suppose for a um, global jury today, an, an assimilated diaspora that we have in many respects, the kind of leaders, uh, the kind of um, role models or teachers um, that we need today are those who um, can basically work in the world today and are rooted in today's world, but also can simultaneously inspire um, young Jewish people with a love of, of Yiddishkeit. And it's really striking that balance, I feel, which is where all comes in. We kind of, at that crossroads, you know, we don't want people to go down a path of um, segregation. We don't want people to go down the path of um, assimilation. There's a third way, and it's, I think Ort's way is really striking that balance for people in a very open, pluralistic, inclusive um, environment that we give people the tools to, you know, have a foot in the real world, but also understand who they are as young, confident, engaged Jews. So, obviously, this is a question I've spent a lot of my time thinking about and working on both, both really you asked two questions. One was about the situation with BDS and anti-Semitism on campus, and, and the other about uh, engagement of young Jews with, with the, the Jewish the tradition and community. Um, and, and so I'm gonna answer them separately, even though I understand there is some interrelationship between them in, as the way you phrase the question. Because honestly, I don't think it's just Jews that are unprepared, have drifted away, that are uh, shocked and unable to respond when you see what happens on campus. Because frankly, with all due respect, some of this stuff that's coming uh, on campus is some of the most outrageous, uh, despicable, untrue, uh, you know, accusations and calumnies that exist in our society anywhere. I mean, I remember when I first started working at Hillel, um, and I thought I knew that, you know, yes, Israel gets criticized for some of its policies, and, you know, we're all just criticizing Israel's policies, and that's not what it is at all, right? Then, then you know, this stuff just kind of comes out of the sewers, um, and, 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 you know, and, and it's very hard uh, as rational people, you know, who, no matter how educated you are, 
you know, to, to, uh, to know effectively how to respond. And by the way, a lot of what happens on campus isn't just coming from students, it's coming from faculty. Um, and you ever tried to be a student on a college campus when your faculty takes a certain position, uh, you know, and has ac academic freedom and you're supposed to stand up to the, you know, to, to the faculty on campus? With all due respect, our kids go to college to go to college. They go to college to take courses. They go to college to go to football games. They go to college to, to make friends. They don't go to college to be on the front lines of the, you know, of age-old anti-Semitism and the war against the, you know, the Jewish state. And yet, after, you know, they sometimes have to do that, and our job is to help them and support them. But let's, but let's not get, um, I, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to, to, uh, to, 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 for us to think that that's a product of, of students drifting away or being unprepared. I think it's, it's being confronted with something that they shouldn't have to be confronted with, that our universities should know how to stop, um, and, uh, and our community needs to be more aggressive in stopping. But in the meantime, our students are on the front line, um, and, uh, and, and we do need to support them. Uh, in every way we can in those fights, and of course we do from Jewish federations, all of our networks of, of support, Hillel's, et cetera, uh, are in the business of helping them, uh, helping them respond. Uh, on, on the question of, uh, of engagement, of you know, use the phrase drifting away, you, you probably can guess from my earlier comments that I don't use that phrase and that I don't, I don't uh, you know, I don't particularly uh, identify with it, but I understand it and it's a very common phrase. Uh, I, I'll, I really, I'll you know, refer back to what I said before. I, I think that we are uh, really masters of Jewish engagement, whether you think about camps, youth groups, trips, immersive trips, um, uh, you know, uh, all the various uh, you know, ways that we have successfully uh, engaged people, of course, you know, I know Hillel engagement very, very well because I was the CEO for six years and I saw the research. I know that when you engaged, when we were able to get somebody to engage in an activity on campus, the Jewish identity rose. It works. These programs work. Um, so uh, I, I think, and certainly as uh, times change and the environment changes, you have to adapt the programs, you have to improve them, you have to uh, modernize them, you have to make sure that they can, that they reflect the diversity of the community to, to speak to things I spoke before. So there's a lot of work to be done. Um, and you know, I'm sure the art schools are, are, are expert in a lot of that work. But I have no doubt that if we do that work, that, uh, that we can be successful uh, in reaching uh, in reaching, uh, you know, our entire uh, our, our entire young uh, Jewish adults, uh, there is there's no question in my mind that uh, that we have the capacity, the initiative, uh, and the, edu the the educators and the you know and the talent to do it. Uh, but but we have to do the we have to do the work, and and we have to support the organizations that do the work, which is what we try to do, um, and uh, and 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 keep trying, keep at it. You know, if you think about growing up. I mean, this rise of anti-Semitism that we're dealing with, which is a huge issue that, of course, federations and, 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 and everyone are dealing right, with right now. And, and let's go back to the college campus for a second. If you're 18 years old today in America, and you grew up in a Jewish suburb somewhere, Westchester, New York, or Beachwood, Ohio, where, you know, where Jim Lodge is from, and I, you know, and, and, uh, and, I, and I know well, and, you know, being Jewish your whole life there was nothing, it wasn't a negative, it was, it was a, probably a, a net positive for you, right? You had great friends, you, you went to, you learned things, you had a network of, you went on trips maybe, or to camps or to things. There was, you, you didn't experience anti-Semitism. You're not from, you're, you're three generations from the Holocaust. You probably don't have a Holocaust survivor, um, you know, in, uh, uh, in your family. The, the idea that, that, that you're going to experience blatant anti-Semitism is so out of your mindset that when you are confronted with it, at first, who, who, who would expect that you would recognize it in, and instantly know how to, you know, how to respond to these things that are, that are coming at you? So, so it, in, in a way, we've created a, a great world for our young, uh, our young people, right? Because they were able to just to fit into the world. Uh, and now uh, we see that we, of course, have to make sure that they're prepared for these, uh, these challenges that, that you've identified. Sure. Eric, you were talking about how JFNA supports JDC, Jaffe, and Ort, and we're speaking specifically about more that demographic.
topic is on my mind. I want to talk about B'nai Mitzvah around the world. And at UJA Federation of New York, they have a great program called Give a Mitzvah, Do a Mitzvah, and a teen program for philanthropy. So my children and other children I know get together in these giving circles to balance out the party with the mitzvah, the Torah reading and the learning with the mitzvah. And I would love to hear from you, Eric, a bit about how young people are thinking about philanthropy and their impact throughout the world and other children and other people. And then Dan, I would love to hear about how B'nai Mitzvah is celebrated in your schools and in your communities around the world. Well, I'll be very brief because I know we're just about out of time, but I, I, I think that the, uh, we, we clearly know that, that uh, our, our young people are motivated by doing good for others. Um, and want to be involved in social justice. You mentioned, Barbara, the history of this great synagogue in which we, in which we sit today uh, and others. They don't necessarily see it as part of Jewish commandedness um, and mitzvot, which I, is part of our responsibility and part of what, we're, uh, what is being uh, taught in the schools. But I think it's a huge opportunity for us to connect the passion uh, to it, um, uh, to mitzvah. Uh, to meet vote and commandments, the, but the, and the other thing I'll just again say very very quickly is the your point about teaching philanthropy is really uh, critical. It's why we have a young leadership cabinet. It's why we have change makers. It, it's why multi generational philanthropy is uh, is such an important piece of work at UJA um, and uh, and and through JFNA out to to federations because you you know we you, we may spend a lot of our time. Uh, you know, thinking that we don't follow our parents, but the truth is that we, you know, we very much absorb what our parents teach us and our kids absorb what we're modeling for them. Um, and some of the most powerful experiences that I've talked to young, young adults about in philanthropy is when they sat together with their parents and with their grandparents uh, and talked about how they are gonna together engage in philanthropy and that the grandparents listen to the grandchildren about their perspectives and, and how it's changed. Uh, and they and they act together collectively. I think um, in answer to your question, I probably easier to just like broaden it out a little bit. One one of the um, the key values of 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 ort is is something called tikkun am. And I, I don't know how uh, aware you or anyone is about this value of ours called tikkun am. And it's kind of like a a counterpoint to tikkun olam. And Tikkun Olam, we're, we're all obviously uh, pretty familiar with, and it's also one of our uh, values as well. Um, but Tikkun Am really is, is about strengthening and f the flourishing of Jewish communities and being able to sort of ensure that our students around the world have an understanding of who they are from a, from a Jewish perspective. So what we're trying to do now more um, because of that value, to really push it to the forefront, um, is really extend our, our offering in terms of the Jewish experience that we give to all of our students. And, and bar and bat mitzvot are certainly part of that because you know, we really feel, and, and again, it comes back to engagement and, and maybe even assimilation. You know, for, I think for, for many sort of young people today, they, they, they understand the whole tikkun olam feeling. You know, for them, certainly for many maybe um, young liberal Jews here in America today, you know, they're increasingly interested in, in issues around um, environment, um, equality, um, diversity, and you know that we understand. But I think we what we really want our students to equally be committed to is is a commitment to Hebrew culture and Klal Yisrael and Jewish practices as well. Um, because a, a concern of mine is that that Tikkun Olam without Tikkun Am is a potential sort of pathway towards assimilation. So we're tr really trying to find um, that balance or fusing of those two values for, for our organization. And, um, you know, we've, we've run a number of programs bringing students from the UK to, to places in the former Soviet Union to share um, bar and bat mitzvah experiences with them. Um, we've we've uh, raised money for students around the world who haven't had obviously, unfortunately, the funds to, to have those 
um, celebrations with their friends and their families as well. And the curriculum that we're building now to support um, many of our schools around the world is really to strengthen um, the Jewish learning and experience of all of our, of all of our schools. I think on that note, maybe we will close up, but thank you both so much for sharing so much insight. I'm very, very proud continually to be involved with ORT and to be involved with the Jewish Federations of North America and really all the federations across the country that I have been able to meet and visit. Um, I can't wait to be traveling and visiting more of our communities around the world. I hope all of you, um, uh, who are watching virtually or in the room will take advantage of those opportunities to go with us and see the work and be part of the work. Um, and really just thank you all for coming and, and for all that you do. Thank you. We look forward to welcoming you.